Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Get Cooked and we've got a very special episode for you this week because it is Get Cooked meets Crossy's Corner. It is Crossy getting cooked. Welcome Martin Cross. Hey, great to see you Sarah, really great. Yeah, and we're in different time zones. I've got a wine here sitting next to me and you've just had a coffee so the world's a bit upside down. Ah, oh, there we go. Well done. <laughs> um, look Martin, I want to get into a little bit about your own rowing career because we're so used to hearing you on the airwaves talking about world rowing commentating uh you're one of the voices of world rowing iconic in rowing but let's get back to where it all started for you you attended the cardinal vaughan memorial school then queen mary at university of london where you rowed for the college boat club how did you find the sport of rowing and get into it yeah it's a good question sarah and the thing was i was like i think quite a few rowers rubbish at sport you know football was just I was terrible at I, I couldn't run couldn't really catch a ball play cricket and that was kind of embarrassing for me because my dad was like a, a really good footballer he was head of sport at the Cardinal Vaughan school where I was at and you know I was kind of getting older in into sort of ninth grade and dad said you know maybe rowing would be your sport Martin so I kind of grasped it with both hands and I found out I was no good at rowing <laughs> and I was, I was at the bottom of about 20 kids, you know. Um, and the thing that made the difference for me was that um, re- I think relative from the bottom to the top level, that there wasn't so much compared to the bottom of football and the top, you know. So um, I had less to make up. And what made the difference was in, in year 10, my dad appointed a guy who was an international rower guy called Jim Clark and he was rowing with the national squad and he was an amazing role model for me and he also used to talk to me like I I was pretty geeky as a kid like a nerd you know a bit like I'm about rowing now but you know he used to speak to me and like I was a normal bloke and talk to me about his races you know racing the Russians and the Czechs and the East Germans and I kind of got captivated by this and and he got me to join a club which was Thames Tradesman so straight away I was I was rowing more than the kids at school because I was doing, you know, three other sessions a week at the club. So I started to rise up and rise up. And, um, and, and the, the target for us was, you know, there, there was myself and another decent guy who also joined the club. And, and we went to the national championships and, and won the pairs as a sort of 16 year olds. And that was really the springboard for me. But it was quite a torturous, um, I, I think the other thing was, you know, when you get good at something, that you, at sport that you haven't been good at, it's, it's, you just grab it with both hands. And I think that's the case with a lot of rowers. Totally. I have totally the same experience that I, I was sporty, I liked sport, I was kind of, you know, I was athletic and had done reasonably well at a few things, but it wasn't until I found rowing and it was like, right, this is my thing. So I totally, totally get it. But yeah, couldn't throw or catch a ball to save myself. Um, So then I guess you had a bit of a role model who was rowing internationally. So that pathway, I guess, was opened up to you from a very young age. So was it at that point that you decided, I think I want to row for GB, that's that's my trajectory. Do I I want to go to the Olympic Games? Is, Is that where you were headed from that point? Well, I always had the magic of international rowing. It was like I was, you know, he used to tell me about the races in great detail, you know, where they had a burn and a push and how they went off the start and what they did at the finish. And so I knew about international rowing. It was like he, he was, he was, it was like me watching videos of international rowing before there were any videos to watch. <laughs> yeah. So I, I was always, you know, enraptured by it but I think the the difference that uh, for me was when I was 17 I got to row with three other guys that were were frankly better than me from another school with this coach David Tanner who who subsequently became performance director of British Rowing and um, and we we were a great crew we won everything I used to sit in the stroke seat and uh, and we won Henley, we won the Visitors' Cup, um, we got a silver medal in the World Championships, and, and three of us loved it so much that we wanted to carry on. So I think, you know, from that year, um, and, and everything I did, you know, like choice of career as a teacher, so I'd have holidays long enough to row. So I think from by the time, I had wanted to be an airline pilot, but I had no 
my I was rubbish at maths and science <laughs> and uh, so so it was like okay I'll do international rowing and therefore I'll choose a career that allows me to do that like like teaching so from 17 I was set on a pathway to be an international rower that's incredible and and obviously you know fast forwarding then you know and and we say this in every interview when when you're talking to people who are done with their careers it's so easy to just okay we'll just fast th- forward through you know five or ten years even though it's like blood sweat tears and you know a roller coaster of a ride but uh, so not to diminish any of that time but uh, you went on to win an Olympic bronze medal in the Coxless Four at the 1980 Olympic Games. How was that experience? And then how did that lead into rowing the Cox Four at the 1984 Olympics, where of course you won the gold medal? Yeah, well, first of all, the, the, the bronze medal, it was with the guys I'd rowed with at school, plus one other guy, Dave Townsend. Um, and we still, we, we talk on Zoom every week now. We, we've kind of suddenly, you know, just got quite close together. But that was all I ever wanted in sport because relatively, um, you know, gold medalists were people like from East Germany. They, they were, you know, the, the, the top people or maybe the Russians. Or if you won a gold medal in the West, you were an exceptional athlete, which I, I didn't see myself as that. So people at the time, it was people like Seb Coe, um, Steve Ovette, uh, Daley Thompson, the decathlete. So um, I was... All I ever wanted was, you know, to win a medal. And the fact it was an Olympic medal was just incredible. So um, we we managed to be the best in the West at that Moscow Olympics. And um, we had one of our best rows ever. And, and, th- and that was it for me. And the years, the years after that, so every, every year up until that 1980, I've been going up and up and up in my career. And then the next year I rode with my uh, Dave Townsend, uh, sort of dropped out the guy in the three seat we had a my old teacher Jim Clark come back in and we just went like this and for the first time ever I blew out at the world championships finished 10th the next year um, I went um, they uh, they wanted to they wanted to put me into the national squad in, in, in it's a different kind of arrangement uh, from a, a set crew we'd always been coached by this guy David Tanner he was out, and so I was kind of untrustworthy. I thought it was untrustworthy, so I decided I'd scull instead. So I went to join a young group of, of scullers, which included Steve Redgrave and his coach, Mike Sprackley. And we were in a quad in the World Championships. We made the final, but we came right at the back of the field. And, and so that didn't leave too much to build on. Mike Sprackley went to work in India, so there, was, there wasn't the continuity there. Um, David Tanner came back. We ended up doing another four, this time with Budget in the four, um, who was the guy I rode with in the Olympics. That bombed. It was at the back end of the final. So we went into the Olympic season with, um, you know, no results. And the way they structured things, they had a, they had a squad system again. So you were kind of, um, and I all I wanted to do was do a pair with my um, my best mate from the Moscow for John Beatty. Um, and, and so they put the two of us plus four other guys in what they called the Cox four group. And if you're in the Cox four group, that was a group who couldn't really row very well, you know, lots of smack, <laughs> and, you know, and, and the other group was the eights group and they were guys that knew how to row and uh, were, were nice and smooth. And the Cox four group was run by Mike Sprackley and, um, and we had in that group, Steve Redgrave, who was trying to go to the Olympics as a single sculler. So all winter, there were three pairs and we used to just smash each other up. And, you know, there was a lot of anger. And, you know, I think that winter I was trying to set up um, a, a rowers union, trade union, the International Rowers yeah. and Scholars Club, just to, to protect rowers from the national squad. And it was just mad. And... Um, and, and so what Spracklin realised was that he wanted the three strokes of the pairs in a crew. And, yeah, wow. and, he, and, and he kind of had a thing that if Redgrave doesn't make it as a single, then he's going to be the next one in. And that's kind of what happened. So it was, it was most unlikely um, 
you know, we got to an Easter Easter training camp and, and Spracklin said, right, this is the four I want, and, you know. And, and I said, well, I don't want to row in it. And he said, well, why? <laughs> and I said, well, because Redgrave wants to do the single. He doesn't want to do the four, so I don't want to row with him. I want to row with my mate. So we were very unlikely. Um, and the first regatta of, of the season, we row, I rowed with my mate, with John Beatty in the four. Um, I was at Stroke and John was at Bow. And we had Budget and Holmes in the four. This was at Mannheim. And we were racing the West Germans who got the silver medal the year before. And uh, we had a great race with them. We were down and we just came right through at the finish and we won by about half a length. And then that was the Saturday. On the Sunday, Redgrave, who singled that, that uh, Saturday, came third. He jumped into the stroke seat. I went back to bow. I remember the warm-up out in the night before. It was just for, you know, I just thought, oh my God, what's this? I couldn't hardly keep up on a start. And the next day we raced the West Germans and we were, you know, at 500 metres gone, we were already about two lengths up on them. It was just like completely different. And from that moment on, that was the crew that was going to race the Olympics. And, and we wore T-shirts with things you know, called the unlikely lads because we were <laughs> such an unlikely crew. that You know, everybody wanted to row with their mate. Redgrave wanted to do the single. And yet here we were coalesced in this, you know, amazingly fast four. That's amazing. And I mean, not like you to be a rebel at all. Um, <laughs> but do you think that having that unlikely circumstance actually created something for you all to get behind and draw you together? Do you think that fueled the success? Um, it's really interesting because I think, you know, looking, looking at the Moscow Four, we, we were together for, you know, um, for about five years from leaving school. So we had really good connections. We really looked after each other. The, um, the Olympic four from 1984 had, um, it, it didn't really have that level of connection. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, Steve's one of my closest friends now. I don't see a lot of budge. Uh, Andy Holmes isn't alive anymore now, but, um, but at the time we didn't have a lot of things connecting us other than the fact that we were really, really fast. <laughs> and 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 suddenly we were at the top winning you know winning first place in international regatta and none of us had had that success and and so that kind of drew us together you know because it, it was it was a game changer for everyone in that crew you know um Andy Holmes had been at the back of the field uh, he'd had one good race in 81 budget had had one good race in 81 but had been at the back of the field I'd been at the back of it, back end of the final. Redgrave had, had been sort of at the same thing, and all of a sudden it was we're in this and it we're in this amazing unit, and and it was that that kept us together. We didn't really have the bonds of you know friendship or, or closeness at that time. In fact, it, you know, as you talk about it, it's kind of how a lot of the systems operate now because it's very rare now with these centralised models that you get, I think, crews that have longevity and come together through friendships and, and spend many years together. It's sort of like you turn up to the trials and you get thrown together based on, on speed. So I guess it's almost like one of the first times that kind of really happened. Yeah, I, 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 I kind of... I, I did miss the closeness. I mean, I, I remember, mm. you know, after we'd won in Los Angeles um, and we'd had the medal ceremony, I kind of said, should we just paddle off to a corner of the lake and sit with this? Because it's, we won't have much time to be together. And um, let, let's just go and contemplate. And it was all like, you know, they just said, no, mate, don't want to do that. Let's get in. <laughs> and it, I think it was a kind of yearning for a closer, a closeness, a closer kind of tie, which, which, which wasn't there. Um, and, and for me, it was having had the closeness of guys that I'd rode with since school. You know, I knew what that was like and I missed it, frankly, because I think but belonging to something has always been a big part of my need in rowing and why, why I want to, you know, carry on doing stuff in rowing because I feel like I want to belong. 
I totally agree. And I was talking to someone just last week and talking about my time in sailing and that I that actually made me appreciate my rowing family and, and belonging. And, and that I think that's such a great part of rowing clubs. And sometimes, you know, when you're caught up in the national systems and rowing in high performance, you, you miss that or you lose that. But it, it is really one of the wonderful parts about our sport. And I'm so glad that, you know, I've become involved again. And, and you're rowing yourself now. <laughs> yeah. no, I've, I've got... My blister's back again. We're allowed on the water. Uh, my tennis elbow is still there, but it's allowed me Great. to do enough rowing. So I'm back on the water in my single. We can't row in crew boats yet unless it's a family group. But um, the thing is, Sarah, it's the, the water here is crazy. Like, I, you know, people have gone mad. So that there is like, you know, um, yesterday I was out and there, there are all these blow up paddle boards that <laughs> don't know the rules of the river, blow up canoeists. And there was these, these rubber duck things. There was Ooh, about yeah. six or seven, you know, young, young women sat in rubber ducks in the middle of the navigation channel. <laughs> I've never seen that before. It's so busy um, in lockdown. It's just like crazy yeah and you guys have had some pretty good good weather there of late and of course i'd normally be arriving for henley at this time so it's a bit bit sad yeah oh well we'll just have to save up uh everything for next year but um we'll, we'll keep going um so you know i guess most people would know you as one of the world rowing and henley lead commentators um but you're also incredibly passionate about history and you work part-time as a teacher at the hampton school and interestingly you taught our co-commentator greg searle at the hampton school but went on to row with him in the gb squad give us the lowdown what was he like as a student and what was he like to row with coming out of school yeah he was I mean, I, funnily enough, I taught Greg's other brother that he won the gold with, Johnny, as well. And, and um, part of the story they tell is of um, when I came back from the Los Angeles Olympics, I did a, a, a whole school assembly and with my gold medal. And, um, you know, I remember showing it all to the, to, the, to the kids and they remember that very, very strikingly. And Greg... Um, tells a story because he was by that time he was quite a tall lad he played rugby and he looked at me and he thought well I'm the same height as him now I'm going to be taller so if he can win a gold medal so can I which is an interesting way of looking at it but um Greg used to play at school um it wasn't quite his nickname at school, but um, just coming <laughs> after, we used to call him TFW, which stands for Terry F. He, he it was a character from a Viz cartoon, and he always used to seem to have a bit of a, a, a gormless laugh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait till Greg says this. <laughs> what, what, what he had at school was, um, oh, uh, the other thing, I was his form tutor. So I used to do sex education lessons with Greg and, you know, oh, the guy in that, which was, you know, sex, drugs and rock and roll. So <laughs> it, it was, but one of the things that was apparent for him that he was this amazing rower from, you know, from, he was, he was almost a level up on his brother who'd been very successful. Um, and, um, and he was, we used to look at him like the next Steve Redgrave. Um, and Greg, you know, he, he, he had the success later on in the single that Steve never had in that he won a bronze medal in that. Yeah. But um, he, he was clearly marked out for something, something great. And um, so we've got this, I've, I've actually, you know, worked with him as a commentator. I've actually done some, you know, training and development work with him with the you know company lane four that both greg and i work for so yeah we do a lot of stuff together yeah that's amazing to go from being uh, i guess teacher and mentor uh, and inspiration to to a peer effectively so or a colleague sometimes he's even been my boss i mean you know he's <laughs> he's, an incredible, he's a really really you know good trainer now in terms of working with groups he does a lot of these talks and things he's and you know he's he's very he's very very good at what he does and it's interesting you know when you learn things from people you know people you teach 
yeah. which you know, so you're in the different position. But I, I remember actually rowing with uh, both Johnny and Greg. We were in the eight in 91 in Vienna and um, we had a dreadful heat and, and we had a pretty disastrous, you know, post heat um, <laughs> analysis. And I, you know, I remember sort of saying, because I was in the bows of the boat, you know, if the guys in the middle of the boat step up, don't step up, there are others, you know, can do so, you know, which is kind Ooh. of bravado and bluster. But I, you know, I, I think it was Greg's brother, Johnny, that kind of, you know, reacted to me. And I suddenly thought I was, I was in the situation of when I used to row with my teacher, you know, it, it, I had to be aware of the, the different relationships. So I kind of back right off and apologized um because i was you know it's it's different for your teacher to be old teacher to be saying something and and we actually went on to be very successful in that championship we won a, we won a bronze medal um so great repechage and even better final yeah amazing that's such an amazing story and and cool that that you get to work together now and we get to listen to your insights and i get to be a part of it too so that's it's good fun hanging out with the two of you I think the buzz that we have in, in commentary is just outstanding. I just so, love it so much. I love it too. I miss it so much. Can't wait for 2021. Um, but Martin, you've penned an autobiography called Olympic Obsession in 2001. You write uh, about rowing for The Guardian. You commentate internationally. But what many people don't know is you're actually a movie star. Can you tell us a little bit about one of I think the all-time rom-coms, The Notebook, which you feature in. Right, here's, here's the thing, you've got to be careful, <laughs> yeah, so on my Wikipedia page there is a very, very good entry about me <laughs> being um, in uh, a, a sort of rowing coach in uh, the rom-com, um, The Notebook, and um, that is actually not true. Not true. I know. <laughs> Someone told me this at Henley, so they must have read your Wikipedia page and told me. I know. So I know who put it on, and I who think put it, it on? was it was a school friend of my daughter's. <laughs> oh, that's such a shame. I was going to ask for an intro to Ryan Gosling. I know, and I I kind of I read it sometimes, and I want it to be true. I I kind of left it on there because it's quite funny, really. It was so good. Well, you fooled me, but someone had actually told me, I think it was at Henley last year. So this is doing the circuit. Yeah, yeah. His sculling isn't very good, mind you, so I was going to give you a bit of flack about that. So you get off the hook, actually. Yeah, that's, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it isn't very good. <laughs> so how did you actually get into um, the rowing commentary and the journalism and I guess the inspiration to um, to write an autobiography as well. Yeah, well, um, maybe I'll start with the autobiography. So um, I sort of collected a lot of stories about rowing, you know, first of all from Jim Clark, but also I love talking with other international rowers. And so I would, you know, a lot of the times in championships, I would spend time with you know, the Pim are great friends with the Piminovs, uh, a, a guy from Norway called Alf Hansen, Rolf Torsen, um, you know. Um, and, and so we just spent time and they tell stories about the rowing. So Mike Tatey was another guy who coaches the American Eight now and spend loads of time. And I was just aware of all these stories. So I kind of wanted to kind of capture those stories. And I had a kind of in... Um, about 97 I had I was unwell I, I kind of had like a, a breakdown um, and so coming out of that one of the ways of coming out of that was um, to write this book and um, I kind of I got an agent quite quickly I wrote the chapter with Steve Redgrave and Andy Holmes which is called Soulmates and and that chapter it was kind of talking about the relationship between Steve and Andy which wasn't always that great you know, and Andy kind of had a thing that he thought Steve was soft. And only, <laughs> no, you know, and only pulled hard when, you know, it suited him, which, you know, was just the way that Andy looked at life, really. Um, but I wrote that chapter, I got an agent, and the agent tried to get it published and couldn't. So 
basically I carried on writing and the way I decided to write was to make each chapter sort of half of my life, but each chapter will be twin with a ca another character. So, you know, with um, that chapter Soulmates, it was, it was me and then it was Andy Holmes and Andy Holmes' experience of Steve. Um, I did a chapter with Greg um, called The Singles Game, which was me trying to skull um, and, and, um, and that was twinned with, with Greg in the single. And Tales of Eight was around me being in the eight in Vienna and, and the Barcelona Olympics. And it was twinned with Mike Tatey coaching the eight. So I, I went to you know, visit 14 other people. I transcribed about 80,000 words of taped interviews and still no publisher. And in sort of around 2000, we finally got, it was about the, it was the 30th, we just had our 30th rejection and it was the 31st, you know, person, Derby Books that said they publish it. So um, when I read it now, um, I kind of think, did I write that? You know, cause it, it seems, you know, I can't quite believe that I wrote it, but you know, it was, it was something that came, I'm, I'm kind of pointing at this bit now, something that came from here. <laughs> it was cathartic. Um, so it was something I felt I had to write. And, and, and that was, I suppose that got me into the idea of I can write and journalism, you know, the work I did for The Guardian. The, the stuff with rowing commentary, um, it, it, that's about belonging. You know, I wanted to feel when I stopped rowing, I, I was with the Athletes Commission. So I used to go to the regattas, but I really wanted to feel like I, you know, belonged and had a connection with the sport. And there was a kind of gap um, for the Atlanta Olympics, uh, Radio 5, BBC Radio 5 did commentary on the Olympics, but they didn't have a rowing summariser. So ninety, I remember trying to do the job of rowing reporter in 95, you know, they said, used to have to ring up on a telephone and give the report down the phone. <laughs> and I, I was terrible. And you know, the first report I gave, I spent all the afternoon writing the report and not really watching the regatta. And I went on the phone and I started to talk and the, la the lady on the end said, you know, you sound too miserable, you know, that's, we can't take that. And I said, oh, it's my first report. And she said, oh, we'll try and smile when you give it, you know, and that'll help you. <laughs> so I was really, I was really, really bad when I started. But I got, I was with this guy called Alan Green, the radio, he was he's Britain's top sort of soccer commentator. Um, and, and I learned so much from him and working with him. That's really where I began to sort of pick up commentary skills, I guess. Yeah, that's, that's really amazing. And I think it's really important to have a role model. I remember the first time I did it was with Tim Gavel, who's a very well known, um, he, uh, ABC commentator here in Australia, does a lot of rugby and rowing and, and all sorts of sports. And Tim is very, um, quietly spoken, um, almost a bit of an introvert. And I remember sitting in the commentary box with him for the first time and he's, he's talking quite quietly to me and I'd known Tim my whole rowing career being from Canberra. And then when he got up to start, he stood up, he pushed his chair back, he got his microphone and got in this really almost athletic position and this whole different persona and voice came out and I couldn't believe the energy and the transformation in him and you know it it's it's a bit counterintuitive because i think at first you feel like a total idiot doing something like that but then you realize that that comes through in in your voice and and how people hear you and you know you and i get quite worked up in the commentary box now but i think we're just so passionate and into what we're doing that that kind of happens naturally but you realize uh, we probably look completely ridiculous it's a it's a good thing that for most of the time there's not a camera on us when we're doing that I think that's a great story because, you know, I know other people that are like that and that ability just to, you know, switch in is, is just priceless. Yeah, absolutely. And it's good fun as well. Let's be honest. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, just on that as well, and, and I hope that Greg watches this. I know he's watched many of them. Um, but who's your favourite commentator to work with, Martin? You. Uh, I, yeah. <laughs> Sucked in, Greg. We, no, no, I, no, we love I, Greg. Um, <laughs> I think you know when when we're when we're on song. I, I just I, I think the, the 
like I said earlier, the, the three of us working together, I think, you know, everybody brings something very different to that, to that party. And I think we, we've got to know each other well, that it kind of is, is works, works between the three of us, you know. Um, so I think um, I kind of feel I've got to know lots of, so I've got to have this, you know, this data of it, this information. Um, and I think partly that's having worked with David Goldstrom because he, he used to spend most of the time looking at his information rather than looking at races because he worked so hard to, you know, prepare stuff. Greg sees things that I never see. You, you, you see things that I, that I don't see at all. So, you know, that's, that's why it's, it's like the perfect relationship. Well, and you actually gave me some really good advice when I first started because I was like that. I remember um, Peter O'Hanlon and I, our, our first gig was um, in Korea with you and um, Chungju in Korea. I was trying to remember that. Yeah, and, um, and I remember we were just pouring over the results and writing things down and, and you said to me, look, you've only recently finished drawing, you know, all of these people get out there and talk to people and find the stories. And it was such a good piece of advice because, you know, I soon learned that I was never going to be able to contend with your insane Excel spreadsheet, but also, you know, that that's what people want to hear is hearing those backstories and, um, you know, hopefully we're not being told too many fibs, although from time to time we do get a, a, a misinformation out there, but we, we try to be as factual as possible. <laughs> well, you know, there was, was an interesting thing. So last year they did, which was great, they did all the races on, on film. So, you know, Greg came there early and I was working with Greg early on. Um, and, and we were basically in that commentary booth from you know half an hour before the start of racing to you know at the end of racing we had a minimal time for lunch break because we had to go round to you know from the commentary booth on the other side of the course so we couldn't really talk to anyone which was a real issue because that's where you get the mm. real richness of commentary but there, there was yeah. one little time we were out in the evening and we came across um Garetti Mario Garetti not Mario I can't remember his Martino. First name. Martino Garetti and um, and he was in the lightweight single skulls, and he was using these foils on the top end of his the Randall um, foils, yeah, yeah. And so we got the inside story from him. He just told us everything about the foils, how he tried them, and how he had to move his gearing, and they were definitely quicker. And and then you know the next the next day, and I think it was on the semi-finals. You know we were doing um, commentary on his race, and that was just the best because we could just talk about them. And you know, um, but it's it's a, it's a kind of trade-off really because the best thing for me is to rock up at a World Cup and then get on the bike and be with the coaches watching the mm. race, and just hear what they're saying about other crews, and you know hear stories. And then yeah. be able to maybe bring some of that into the commentary. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, let's let's switch our focus now to talking about the current situation and where to here for world rowing, because um, obviously, you know, we're watching with interest and uh, what's happening globally, and and we can't be overseas commentating um, this year. So it's going to be a really interesting next year. We've just seen the event calendar from World Rowing released just today. Um, so I guess to start with, COVID, lockdown, we're all starting to come out of that in varying degrees and slowly. But what are some of the opportunities or silver linings that you think there might be from this COVID lockdown for athletes who are preparing for the Olympics in 2021 now? Yeah, that, that's a really great spot. And, you know, um, I, I, I think um, particularly with younger crews um so i would put in that um the british squad that had a lot of people say uh both the men's and the women's eight so let's talk about them now um so they had a lot of people stop after rio and the british um the british men's eights the standard has kind of gone down they haven't won a gold medal um you know they got bronze last year bronze the year before but uh, they've got some great guys in that, in that eight who have come through the American system. Tom George, mm. for example, he just, you know, went sub um, 540 on the, the 2K test on the concept to um, people like Ollie Wynn Griffith. And, and 
they're on an upward trajectory. So I kind of, you know, was looking <clears throat> at the eights field last year, the British eight, you know, well back from the Germans and the Dutch and thinking, well, they're not going to be competitive for a gold medal. Um, I think that's probably the extra time has given them a chance, you know, um, to, you know, re recoup themselves, feel good about what they're doing. You know, all the scores in the ERG have gone up. And, and I think it's the same for the women's eight as well. Um, women's eight has been showing really good speed. Um, I think the, I was talking with the, the coach, James Harris, the other day. And, um, you know, they, they show speed in training pieces that is medal speed. There's no doubt about mm. that. Yeah, if you look at, you know, turning it on on the big occasion, like last year's World Championships, they, they qualified, but they were fifth place and they were behind, well behind that great race between Australia and New Zealand. So I think for them, it's getting some more experience and, and the chance to be more competitive at the top end. So, I, you know, I think there are opportunities for younger crews. I, I find it interesting looking at someone like Mahe Drysdale, um, you know, that really sort of gut-wrenching post that he wrote about not having the motivation and, and now sort of rediscovering it. But having gone to the games at 42, um, you know, I, I'm not so sure that that's so much of a, a great thing for Mahe, you know, another year older at 42, another year for Olaf Tufta. So I think they're a balance between different athletes, different bits of the sport. Yeah, well, it's interesting those, um, you know, couple of athletes you picked out. I'm thinking what is quite interesting is the single skulls. Emma Twig obviously taking some time out. She's really been on the up and up, you know, looking very good, obviously, for this year. But you would think that she's kind of in that sweet spot where I, I can only think another year for her would put her in an even better position. And the same with Ollie's idler, you know, just his trajectory is just so steep. So, you know, perhaps with those two single scholars, you know, I was thinking about them today and I thought, well, I think that's actually good for both of them. Yeah. You know, that's going to be, I, I, I talked with Ollie a while back and um, one of the interesting things he said uh, was, he reckoned he's quite comfortable in the last 500 sitting half a length down, mm -hmm. on, you know, because that, that was an amazing singles race last year where you, you, you know, you almost, you had six scholars within the length of each other. And, um, you know, Ollie's been working on trying to row longer, you know, uh, improve his start. But I, I kind of think he will go into that race in the middle. You know, people will lead like Stefan Breunig led through, um, well, into the last 500 metres, the Dutchman. Um, you know, Chettle Borsch had, you know, some injuries and, and he took it on. Um, so I, I just think that's going to be a phenomenal race, really. I think the water won't be as nice as it was in Linz. I think that might, you know, that might come into it. So, um, and, and, you know, Sferi Nielsen is, was on a stellar trajectory up and, and he was right in the mix too. So I kind of think that's going to be a very, very exciting final. But I don't think Zeidler will, will just go out and leave. Um, and the women's one is, is going to be fascinating because I think, you know, there was such, um, you know, uh, a kind of an, almost an anger in Sunita Paspura's performance. I remember her last year in the Worlds, the semi-finals, mm. you know, she yeah. had qualified by miles and she was just knocking it knocking it you know it was just whether well, it was something she needed to do herself I know you know her, she suffered a bereavement in the family which would you know so she had to miss some of the regattas but um wh whether that will turn itself into you know similar motivation in um in 2021 at the Tokyo Games I I, I don't know I I I, I can't see her being that dominant in the Tokyo Games compared to, you know, the way she won the championships last year. So I think, you know, Emma's going to Emma's gonna come into that, that race as well, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's going to be really exciting and seeing how everyone moves through this next 12 months and how the various systems recover. And, and speaking of systems, we know that Australia moved to a centralised training model or training system for the first time following the Rio 2016 Olympics. There's been some rapid improvements in those results in both the men's and the women's squads and across that entire system. As an outsider looking in quite closely, what are some of the biggest changes 
as a commentator that you've seen to the Aussies on the international stage, some of those Aussie crews? Well, you know, I think the Aussies, I mean, I'm thinking particularly about the men's quad now with, with it John Drearson, you know, that technically you, you always look to Aussies to be really sort of well drilled um, and, um, and move really well. But I think, you know, the, the first thing that I would say about the Aussies in, in terms of a more centralised system is that this particular way of rowing that, uh, that they paddle with, with, with a kind of, you know, exaggerated pause at the back end. And, um, and so everybody's talking about the Aussies technically. And so everybody's trying to wonder, you know, what's going on. And, and, and you know, um, I was talking with a coach um, like Dave O'Neill, who coaches the women's program at University of Texas, that are just second behind University of Washington. And he pauses with his crews at the finish. And basically he was getting, he worked that out himself. He says, you know, that's a place to, to meet and to gather. But he was getting told, you're copying, you know, the Australians. <laughs> So I think, you know, first of all, the Australians um, are, uh, you know, and, and people just watch and they, and they wonder. And I don't think they quite understand, you know, uh, say with the men's squad, what Ian Wright's trying to do. Um, I think with the women's squad, I mean, that, that's been sensational, really. I think the whole, you know, the emergence of the four to start off with, um, and 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 then the women's eight coming up in terms of the sweep squad and, and adding in the pair this year. I mean, pe pe people are looking at you know a potential colossus, and uh, I don't quite understand how that's been such a high trajectory. It's kind of like a bit of a a sleeping giant. Yeah. Um, and 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 again, I think people love to watch the way that you know. I mean, I. I love to watch the way that, you know, Alex Hill in the four and with Jack Hargreaves when they were on song, when they raced. I, I don't understand. I still don't understand what happened to them this year in that first 500 metres when they lost the race. But, you know, in 2017 and 2018, just love to watch that four. You know, I love to watch that high racing kind of style. Um, and and uh, the way the boat flowed on at the front end. You know, there's so much to look at with the Australian team. Yeah, well, I think the world will be watching coming uh, 2021 because I think, you know, looking at the situation, you know, it's it's highly unlikely that some of these Southern hum uh, Hemisphere crews are going to be able to come um, and actually race internationally pre-Olympics. Um, we saw an announcement from Qantas just today that they're not going to be doing international flights till July 2021. So I, So I think it's... You know, it's going to be interesting to see um, how things pan out and, and the Olympics could well be the next time that we see Aussie and, and Kiwi crews actually racing. So, uh, you know, um, I was I was talking with um, Kerry Gowell and Grace Prendergrass from Kiwi Pair and they said there was there was talk of a kind of Australian and New Zealand bubble, whereas crew, where crews from those countries have raced each other. Yeah, which yep. be you know, it'd be a bit like Henley, a kind of head-to-head -head race, but that would be a fantastic regatta to be at. And, and I, I certainly see that as a possibility because, you know, both, both crews, both countries will need competition. Yeah, well, we'll definitely, we might have to get, get the broadcast and the comms going for that uh, little Anzac showdown. One thing, Sarah, there, there is a European Championship still scheduled. I think that, that you know, in October, that they've yet, I, I can't see how it's going to happen, basically, because of travel problems, but uh, and maybe a second spike in the virus. But at the moment, it's still scheduled for Poznan. Um, you know, w Britain doesn't have rowing at the moment, and um, I, I don't know when that's going to start. Germany and, and Holland are, are rowing, but, you know, the travel is the thing. So the decision, I think, is going to be made in July. So at the moment, potentially, there, there might be a regatta in October. Um, I can't see that Britain will necessarily be there, but I kind of think, you know, if the virus doesn't speak, spar, um, peak too much, that there will be European championships of some sort in Poznan. Uh, yeah, that'll be really interesting to watch from a distance to see how people emerge out of this because I imagine if you haven't had a good preparation, you probably wouldn't want to be 
going to it, would you, showing your cards? Oh, no, I think exactly so. Um, I think the British team are planning to start rowing in September. So that would give them, wow. you know, uh, it's probably going to be too early, you know, early October for them. Yep. Before. Yeah, well, we... We actually, our training centres started back on Monday. So Australia and New Zealand are in a really great position, as you've mentioned, with that bubble hopefully opening up between the two countries in August, September for, for travel. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we're, we're in a very good position at the moment. So I think crew boat rowing more or less starts back on the 1st of July and the, and the training centres started back this week. So, uh, yeah. Tokyo 2021 is going to be a very, very interesting uh, Olympic Games. And, and, you know, people have had various things to say about whether the Olympics should go ahead. But I think the important thing is with the Olympics is that it always takes place within the global context at that given point in time. I mean, it is extraordinary that it's been moved by 12 months, but that was out of necessity. But still, the Olympic Games in Tokyo hopefully will happen in the context of, of where the world world is at. So you know, I absolutely believe in the Olympics and, and what they stand for. And I think it will be a tremendous celebration, hopefully, of, of what the world has come through. Yeah, I I wonder whether they'll have spectators, basically. I, I can see, yeah. you know, the challenge of, of, of 10,000 athletes or, you know, and coaches and the like, um, I, I just can't see it happening, you know, international travel with, with, you know, hundreds of thousands of spectators, but you know, that I, I don't know really. I mean, none of us knows what, what no. will happen next year, but yeah, touch wood as they say. Yeah, exactly. And, and uh, let's grab a tip from you. Who do you think will be the top rowing nation at the Tokyo 2021 Olympics? Well, um, so there are there are contenders. Like so, we, we talked about the Australians. So um, you know who were gold medal in the women's four, very close to gold medal in the women's pair, very close to gold medal in the women's eight. Um, New Zealand's just smashed it last year. Conscious of the fact that when they went to Rio in 2016, um, they kind of fell short. You know, um, and so I, I think there's there's a, there's a question mark over New Zealand, but at the moment they're they're back rowing again. Um, so it could be Australia, it could be New Zealand, Ireland. Um, mm. You know, sensational, really. I mean, for a nation their size. I mean, I know we talk about you know New Zealand being quite relatively you know less populated, but Ireland given with the, the gold medal in the lightweight doubles and Sunita Prospera um, and um, the light, uh, the men's double skull, you know, being close on. Although Philip Doyle has been working as a GP, but, you know, I, I don't know if the Chinese can, can do it twice, you know, like smash and grab like they did last year. I think the women's quad from China will probably win. I don't know about the men's double. I think that would be closer. So it's got to be between Australia, New Zealand and um, an Ireland, really, which seems a bit strange to say that. And, and I think New Zealand have got to be the favourites to, to turn things around. Um, the only thing they don't have is a strong men's sweep squad, really. They've got the pair, but, you know, the eight's got to qualify. The four, I think, has probably still got to qualify, if I, if I can't remember. I think that's right. I think that's right. Yep. Whereas Australia are stronger across the piece, you know, they, they've, got, they've got a decent four that's going to be right there. Um, they've got a good pair, they've got a, a decent men's eight. So potentially Australia have got the boats to dominate the Olympics. I'm going to back us in. I'm going to go with the Aussies. My husband's a Kiwi, so I'm certainly not going to back them. I've got a Kiwi oar on this side of our living room over here and an Aussie oar on this side, so I'm back in the Aussies. I, I did... Um, <laughs> I did a thing with um, Olivia Coffey and um, she uh, rode in the American eight um, and stroked the American quad that won in um, 2015. And she rode for Cambridge and she's married to Mike Blomquist who rose for Oxford and Oxford hate Cambridge. And, you know, yeah. I, so the essentially they, they, have, they have an Oxford or and a Cambridge or sort of, glaring at each other across their study that is that is exactly our house across our living room <laughs> all right it's time for the fast five now martin 
So let's get into it. What's your favourite rowing course to row on? It's got to be the Rotsay in Lucerne. I mean, I would imagine everyone says that, or a lot of people say that. Most, most people have said that. Most people have said that. It is the mecca of rowing for a reason. I love, I love the fact it's near the town, and I love the fact you can go for a banana split and you're in beautiful, you know, scenery with mountains and lakes, and then you, you walk over the back of the town and you've got this incredible 2,000-metre lake of the gods. Um, I went there as a 16-year-old to watch my teacher win a silver medal in the Worlds, and I camped there. So it's got a special place in my heart, Sarah. Yeah, me too. Beautiful. Can't wait to go back. Uh, top track to erg to? Um, lose Yourself, Eminem. Um, I, yeah, I kind of wondered. I, I've got looked at my playlist and I was looking up and down. And basically, <laughs> you know, you've got one shot and uh, generally... And, and, and you've got a really aggressive beat to it. So it kind of does, does stuff. So um, I reckon that. Yeah, good call. Best piece of advice that you've been given? Yeah, well, um, as a, an ex-rugby player turned row, a guy, he used to play number eight for England, Andy Ripley, sadly no longer with us. But he read Olympic Obsession and he said, I was, you know, it's a good book and whatever. But then he wrote this advice, but man, you've got to lighten up. <laughs> <laughs> and that was really, really good advice because I've not managed to do it, but I just still trying to work out how I can just, you know, doing a bit of mindfulness and things like that. But I, I generally think, you know, take yourself less seriously. That's a great, great call. Great call. Uh, career highlight to date. I, I can't get past the Olympic gold. You know, I, people say... It's What's fair enough. Career? Yeah. <laughs> You know, there was a thing with it. I never really felt I belonged to that medal for about 15 or 20 years because I kind of thought I was not, you know, good enough to be in that in environment and I just happened to have one. It's a ludicrous situation to do. Um, and so I used to look at races like winning the pairs in Lucerne or something like that and, you know, just go. But it's, essentially, I'm, I'm reconciled to the whole Olympic gold medal in 84 now and I'm comfortable with it so that one yeah that's that's fair enough I, I I'm glad to hear that because that's uh that's pretty impressive um and the final one hardest session you've ever done so um I think the hardest session that I've ever done um so there's a session on the erg um which well, I, I could get a session on the erg or session on the water. Which one do you want? Give us both. So a session on the erg is a session of doing, it's, it's preparing for a 5K test. So you do 10 500s with one minute's rest in between. And the 500s are, are sort of like four seconds per 500 quicker than the 5K pace. So basically, I can remember a particular session that essentially I went off and I was you know, I don't know whether I was not fine or whatever, but I got <laughs> to about four or five and I just started to do this. And then, um, and then my, my, it got harder and harder and my time got slower and slower. And I just remember being in the most excruciating agony doing <laughs> you know, way outside. And that was a particularly painful session. And um, the hardest session on the water there, there was um, in the Moscow four, we did um, me and the guy behind the guy behind us, Dave Townsend, rode in the three seat. He was a fantastic rower and he was quite smooth, particularly around the back back turn. Nice, nice on the front as well. And I was kind of quite much more aggressive. And we got into uh, this sort of discussion, which quickly turned into an argument that he was trying to say, you know, you've got to be more smooth crossy. So I took that as a threat and then basically said, well, you've got to, you know, effing well, get your, you know, pull your <laughs> finger out and go harder. <laughs> so we, we started getting more and more like this. And this, this was just before we were starting this piece on Lake Zarnum, which was essentially, you know, um, a 12K row where we were doing um, alternates between sort of um, UT1 and UT2. And so, you, you know, you, you do three minutes at UT you see two and then you do two minutes at UT one then then two minutes at UT two, then three minutes at UT one. And I basically decided 
that the UT, the UT2 work would be, you know, UT1 or threshold. So I just went off really, really hard. And the two guys in the bow, just one, you know, they were laughing. It was just like so ridiculous. And then, then stepping up to threshold on, uh, and uh, kept that up for the whole of the, the trip down the lake. Little bit of a break in the middle, but it was just, it was so hard, but I didn't feel I could let up at all because I'd made this thing and nobody said anything in the four. It was just absolute silence, but I was completely dead on my feet at the end of it. And it was all just ridiculous pride. That is so funny. I love how, no matter how long it's been, every person that I've spoken to on this can recount very clearly as though it just happened their hardest session it's like so baby that's been like 40 years and you still like i felt like i was there it's so it's so good it's my favorite question to hear people answer but um crossy thank you so much for joining me tonight I, we could just keep talking and talking i can't believe we've been almost talking for an hour but you know that's that's pretty standard for us i think um but you know people will have to wait till 2021 till they can hear us do it on air whether they like that or not they might just put us on mute and put the put the vision on but but we have a good time anyway so thank you so much it's been absolutely fantastic to hear your story and and to hear your thoughts on on the rowing world moving forward oh brilliant yeah thank you sarah i i, I can't believe it's, it's been an hour but we could go on forever couldn't we totally loved it thank you